during this heavy snowstorm, um, our Marines, I suspect our SSO units, although I don't know, they got very busy and some of our best kills uh, of, of, of this whole bridgehead that everyone talks about were achieved. Um, there was perhaps, perhaps the equivalent of a battalion slaughtered, Russian battalion slaughtered during the snowstorm. That's why Krinky is secure. Um, that's a big contribution to why Dachi has gone the way it has. The th there's things that have been provided to them by the West. Um, you know, you have, they have really serious um, hardware in terms of the US Dauntless Willard boats, which have three machine guns, um, two on each side, one at the front, and then a heavy automatic grenade launcher on the back. It's serious firepower in a very fast vessel. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio. I'm James Hansen. And today we're talking about the latest on the war in Ukraine. And in particular, we're going to talk about the fighting along the Dnipro River and the bridgehead that Ukraine have established around the village of Krinky. Joining me to discuss that is the Times journalist Maxim Tucker, who has reported in the past from the Dnipro with the Ukrainian Marines. Maxim, welcome back to Frontline. Thanks for having me again. And also joining us from his home in Sweden, I'm delighted to say we have Brandon Mitchell, a volunteer combat medic in Ukraine with the Hospitaller's Medical Battalion, who also runs a YouTube channel about his experiences of the war. Brandon, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me, gentlemen. Maxim, just to start with you, I wonder if you can just give us a, a bit of the background as to how we got here. When did Ukraine manage to establish this, this bridgehead at Quinky and how significant is it? So if we go back to the liberation of Kherson in September 2022, the Ukrainians have been trying to make inroads into taking islands on the Dnipro River Delta in that area. Um, this is really swampy marshland, there's very thick vegetation, it's difficult to traverse, it's difficult to dig defences into as well. And the Ukrainians have been incrementally pushing the Russians out of those islands over time, um, to the point where they felt it would be advantageous to try and start making raids across to where the Russian position, positions are on the riverbank proper. Um, and they started that to support the counteroffensive in summer by fixing Russian forces in place at Kazachi Lahari and making raids with special forces there and trying to hold on to positions for as long as they could. And really, I think that was a, an effort to disrupt um, and prevent the Russians from reinforcing the, their defences in Zaporizhia and fix large amounts of Russian forces there. But they've since extended that and tried to take a bridgehead at Krinky. They've tried to maintain a, a bridgehead near Hassan at the Antonovsky Bridge. Um, and I think the ideal scenario for them would have been to take a, um, an area of Kazachi Lahari and an area of Krinky. And you can see on the map that that, that is a road, a key road along the riverbank. Um, and it is flanked by a large sandy area called the Aleshki Sands. And if the, if the Ukrainians had been able to take both those villages, they would have cut off a big stretch of road and been defended by a large sandy area that's almost like a mini desert and it would be very difficult for the Russians to get it back. Now, because of the problems with American ammunition and the shortage that at a really crucial, crucial moment when they were making in inroads at Krinky, they haven't been able to push that much further. They haven't really got further than Krinky. Um, and now the Russians are coming back and hitting them very hard. And a lot of the people that I spoke to said that most of the Marines who are at Krinky spend all their time in the basements hiding from um, our heavy artillery fire. But at the moment, it is still in Ukrainian hands because I know there was that claim from Sergei Shoigu, the, the Russian defense minister, I think last month, saying that the Russians had recaptured it. But that's not actually the case. It's very hard to ascertain what's actually happening at the moment on the ground because the Marines are very, very closed about what happens to it. You can only really speak to them if you have good personal relationships and you'll only speak to individual soldiers. There's that no commander is going to tell you about the general situation on the ground. So we know that people are still there. They're going backwards and forwards. They're taking dangerous missions to, to try and resupply those. There are still some Ukrainians there. What the condition of them is, how long they can hold out is unclear. Let's bring in Brandon. I know you posted a video recently on your YouTube channel from Kherson and, and from the Dnipro. Just tell us a bit about your experiences there. Yes, um, from late August until almost Christmas, I served in Kherson and primarily with 35 Brigade. Uh, I work from medical stabilization point to the beach. Um, all our all our work, all our evacuation work, all our medical work is conducted solely at night. Um, it's quite different from my experience in Donbass, which is the majority of my war. Um, depend, depending on the crossings or the situation, uh, those nights can be very intense. But because uh, because we can only work at night, it's um it's it's very unique to me 
it's a bit, it's it's a it's a unique front compared to Zaporizhia or Donbass by far. Can you just tell us a bit more about the practical difficulties of operating along the Dnipro? Well, I'm told uh, that we have the high ground on the what we call the right bank, the Ukrainian bank. Um, one of the biggest issues I found, uh, say if you were to work uh, what we call a 300 point in Donbass, uh, to go from trenches at zero to the evacuation point, there's so many roads, there's defined roads, whereas we have a long front. Uh, you would know better than me how long it is exactly, but it, it's very limited. Uh, there's only one place to go, to the river, but, but we're along the river. Um, how it gets really difficult is the communication becomes more important uh, through our maps and tablets. Uh, our information as a medic is quite limited compared to, say, a drone pilot. And the 300 points have to be changed so often. Uh, it's not uncommon at night. Uh, so perhaps if I was in the Humvee crew, um, we could go to the beach from possibly three different points at night in dark. And some, some of those points you might not never have been um and also it, it's quite impossible to get familiar with some of those routes during the daytime uh, and this is all down to to night vision capabilities by the drone teams uh, which is is very limited um but uh, of course towards uh, the end of november we had our first attack by a, 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 a thermal vision fpv which now exists in the war uh, so it, it can be very frenetic uh, the pickup points, and um, quite often the brigades. I'd never seen this before. We we tend to double up on each other when one's down on when thirty six is down on vehicles, or perhaps one of our medical points. We're, for example, we're blowing up uh, in thirty five brigade. So there's more there's more cooperation between the brigades than I've seen in Donbass, say for example, sharing resources. Maxim, I know you've been for the times along the Dnipro with the Ukrainian Marines. What did you learn from your experience? So it was really interesting to learn about the kind of equipment that the Marines have, um, the th things that have been provided to them by the West. Um, you know, you have, they have really serious um, hardware in terms of the US Dauntless Willard boats, which have three machine guns, um, two on each side, one at the front, and then a heavy automatic grenade launcher on the back. It's serious firepower in a very fast vessel. Um, they want more of these. They're eager to get more of these kind of floating gunboats, as it were. And I was also on um, the uh, Butcher, which is the Dnipro River's uh, flagship, the, the Ukrainian River Fleet's flagship. Um, and this is a, a kind of heavy artillery boat. It's capable of shooting down drones high in the sky, and it's also capable of supporting Marines as they cross. But I think what we discovered was, for the most part, actually, they were avoiding using these kind of boats unless they were used as distraction or strafing a different area of, off, off the riverbank, um, because they try and get in across the river in small boats and try and use covert actions to get in and resupply. But it's very, very dangerous. And some of the people we spoke to said that every fourth boat gets hit by a drone or blown up by a mine. And it's really difficult work. And even once you're across there, you're, you're dredging through swamp land. It's, it's up to your knees in sucking mud. It's really difficult. And they described it like Vietnam. It's really difficult to, to make inroads. And of course, that's useful for attackers sometimes because that provides cover, foliage and things like that that you might not have in, in the Donbass or areas of Zaporizhia that have been very heavily shelled um, but it's also very difficult going and obviously this as, as Brendan is talking about then having to evacuate casualties you then need to walk them with them back carry them through this very thick mud and get them across the river it's incredibly difficult and I, I suspect that Ukraine is taking a lot more casualties as a result of those difficulties. Brandon does that tally with your experience? That's that's very similar uh, I have never been to the left bank um, I've never volunteered to go to the left bank either, in, in all honesty. Um, many of our people who over there are, in essence, isolated. Um, the casualty evacuations, for example, um, depending on the location of the person, uh, you, you, would, you would consider yourself lucky uh, to be wounded around four in the afternoon uh, before dark. Um, Another big, we have logistical problems there as well. And just as Maxime said, uh, that is swampland. Uh, it's very misleading when people look at deep state or perhaps uh, you, might, you might look at Google Maps. A lot of that land that is there does not exist anymore. 
so so this is this is this is a big problem uh we're increasingly relying on drones um agricultural drones for example which are very expensive and rare uh we did have one in possession that i was aware of at my level that was very impressive that could carry over 150 kilos food ammunition supplies um this this is this is groundbreaking uh what you mentioned about the larger boats the larger assets i have only i have only i have only ever seen one such boat um qu quite often with the river warfare um as it's dictated by the terrain uh the land that might seem the advantage is actually the disadvantage because it's quite obvious so quite typically like a, a classic sas storybook we do have to pick the the worst terrain uh to infiltrate and to exfiltrate it completely completely true point maxim was making about the lack of boats on the dnipro in particular the smaller boats i know that's something that you're very passionate about isn't it uh yes well only through through my youtube channel I've, I've managed to fundraise quite a bit of money um and i'm very passionate about what i call preventative medicine uh Fundraising for tourniquets will not will not help with the necessity of using tourniquets. Uh, things as thermal vision, uh, scopes, uh, things like night vision. Uh, in October, early October, I was contacted by a British organization, Mission Ukraine, and I was told to to make time for them. And, and in our polygon, uh, what we call our training areas in Mykolaiv Oblast, um, a very lovely woman came to visit us to talk about boats. And in our in our rota in our company, uh, she took notes, and within within three weeks she came with her first two boats. Uh, that has now turned into twenty boats, rib boats, and and many of these people are concerned people. That that's very underreported by the, I'm sorry, the mainstream media, the volunteer effort, whether it be Ukrainian or foreign. I, I believe it to be ten, fifteen percent of the war effort, perhaps a monetary value. They supply our boats. Um, I, I've only successfully been able to fundraise for engines. Um, that's an ongoing fight we're having with the Home Office right now, um, with the migrant boats that come across the channel. Um, it was actually the Times that cited and, and helped us verify our research with Mission Ukraine. It currently costs the British taxpayer over five hundred thousand pounds to store such boats in fields in Kent. Um, They've cited many reasons. Uh, they, they have requests from the Ministry of Defence in Ukraine by Southern Command, which is basically Kherson, please give us the boats. Um, to the best we can figure with all our research and the multiple answers from the Home Office, they cited uh, health and safety, which is a classic. Um, then the second refusal was environmental concerns. And the third one was that they're involved in ongoing investigations. Some of these boats have been there since 2017, uh, and some of them are of very high quality, and the motors, the engines, which we found out now that these these boats are scrapped. Uh, it's not even sold under the proceeds of crime acts. Some of these engines are five, ten thousand um, pounds. Not all of them, of course. Um, at a UK level, uh, we even have um, people from from the Welsh Parliament. Uh, who've, who've helped to advocate for us and several MPs, um, we're fighting for those boats now. Uh, it costs more to the British taxpayer, such as the ULEZ scheme, which has just come in. To do it's cheaper to donate to Ukraine, to the armed forces of Ukraine. Maxim, I wanted to ask you about the success that Ukraine may have had or might have in establishing other bridgeheads along the Dnipro. A lot of focus on Krinky, but have they had any further success? And is there any sign that they will have further success? Well, they've had success in, in making raids and, and then bringing people out. But it, as I said, it's very difficult to establish those bridgeheads and, and keep them resupplied. And, and, and heavier drones might help with that, bringing some of these loads across. But you also have to bear in mind that now it's very, very cold. Um, on the Dnipro, and if people fall into the river, you know, they've got a few minutes before they'll be suffering from the effects of hypothermia. So that's been a big problem across the winter and has also prevented um, Ukraine making some of those advances. And really, if you want to advance across the Dnipro, and, and really what Ukraine needs to do to create a, a, a bridgehead where they can build a pontoon bridge, is they'd have to have about a 25-mile bridgehead 
which could push out the Russian artillery from hitting the pontoon bridge. And even then you'd have drones and things like that. So you really need artillery supremacy um, capable of firing across the Dnipro in, in huge quantities just to keep the Russians pinned down and uh, avoid them um, trying to take back those positions. And that's something Ukraine is not able to do at the moment because obviously it has these severe ammunition shortages. Um, you know, you, you have new initiatives in Europe to try and bring in and purchase more ammunition for Ukraine, but it's going to take some time for it to get that. Um, and in the meantime, the Russians have started making their own raids across across the Dnipro, which is something quite new and hasn't hasn't happened in a long time because Ukraine had really been able to dominate that stretch of river. Um, so it, it's a really, you know, it, it's, a, it's a really tricky situation for the Ukrainians now. I think they're, they're trying to consolidate their positions. If they want to break out, they need a lot more equipment. They need a, a lot more ammunition. Um, and they would also have to kind of, you would think they'd have to bring in some more troops because the Marines have been fighting there for a very long time now, several months now, and it's been very intense fighting, it's very uncomfortable. Um, and at some point you think you need troop rotation and some more men in there. And are the Russians experiencing all the same issues on the right bank that the Ukrainians are on the left bank? Well, the, the Russians can pull back to kind of mainland areas which are not so swampy. They obviously, when they try and drive the Ukrainians out of those areas, they have to contest with the thick foliage and, and the, the swamp land um, and the very few roads that are really passable and usable and those are obvious targets. And the Russians have been suffering as a result of that because the Ukrainians have been able to fly FPV drones over the river and hit um, Russian vehicles which are traversing this terrain and these very obvious roads because they have to stick to the bits that aren't swampy. Um, so the Russians have taken heavy casualties there, that's for sure. Um, and they are taking heavy casualties as they try to drive the Ukrainians out. I've spoken to FPV drone pilots who've hit hundreds of vehicles in that region. Um, and you can see a lot of successful videos of, of FPV drones hitting and taking out expensive Russian vehicles. Um, but as we know, Russia has more resources. It's willing to sacrifice men more willingly, more easily to take areas of land. Um, and, you know, they are determined to drive the Ukrainians back across the river. So we'll have to see how it plays out. Brandon, I wonder if you can just talk us through the, the logistics of these raids on the other side of the Dnipro. How, how do they work in practice? Well, everything is determined again, firstly, uh, by terrain. Uh, secondly, in our case, by resources. And the raids uh, that Maxim spoke of, uh, they have been, the Russian raids on our side, uh, they, they've been going on for a long time, um, particularly um, if you go to Kherson city and you carry on further west beyond Potemkin Island, uh, this is attempted daily, uh, maybe every second night. Um, so so this, is, this is quite common. Um, I've, I've witnessed myself, um, oh, for lack of a better term, a hole in one. It's actually very rare. You're relatively safe crossing the river. Your most dangerous point is from one point or the other, uh, embark, disembarking. Mm -hmm. And um, actually by by an 81 mortar, I've, I've seen it hit two boats crossing. It was uh, very impressive. Uh, so so this does happen. Uh, that happened west of Potemkin. Uh, that, that was October and quite common. Uh, when our teams go across, as I said, it's a, it can only be done at night. Um, and again, it depends on what boats we have. And, and what assets we're willing to commit. Uh, that, that's not for me to say. Um, the, the information I can give you is as of yesterday uh, from my former commander at battalion level and one of my friends, a, a scouser a drone operator in one of the territorial regiments who's quite handy. Um, Dachi is held, which is across from Antonivka. Uh, that is completely held. And at a soldier to soldier level, there's rumors that we're making su success in Oleshki city proper. Uh, but I can't confirm that, and I don't know that. But if, if that is true, that makes me happy. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, Krinky is held. Um, how we infiltrate, I have no experience. I've not been on the other side. Um, but in the month of September, October, and November, uh, we paid very dearly for that. And we had high casualties. Uh, when we had our most single success I've seen, um, at the end of November, early December, there was a snowstorm, a very heavy snowstorm for three days. Odessa was blocked. Everything was blocked. Um, perhaps, I believe, uh, forward artillery observers do not exist anymore. It, it, it's all conducted by drones. Uh, Matrice drones are very effective, very expensive. Uh, we've Andres for Mavic drones. But uh, during this heavy snowstorm, 
um, our Marines, I suspect our SSO units, although I don't know, they got very busy and some of our best kills uh, of, of, of this whole bridgehead that everyone talks about were achieved. Um, there was perhaps, perhaps the equivalent of a battalion slaughtered, Russian battalion slaughtered during the snowstorm. That's why Krinky is secure. Um, that's a big contribution to why Dachi has gone the way it has. Um, it's very, very dangerous. Antonivka is the most dangerous place uh, on, on Kherson city side, on our side. But but that was that just goes to show what our infantry can do when their artillery cannot work. Um, hence, we go back, well, we can talk more about that later, what, what we actually need to, to have more success. So our biggest raid success that I, I, I know to be true was because of a snowstorm. Uh, it was an act of God. And Brandon, last time you joined us on Frontline, you were talking about the use of drone guns. Can you just talk a bit more about some of the anti-drone equipment that is being used and the tactics that are being used around the Dnipro? Okay, well, I, um, I, I talked to Kate last time, I believed, and I, I've become quite informed by this. Um, I've spent a lot of time on the drone positions uh, to try to understand more, to use it as my, for, for my fundraising platform. Uh, I've been to Luhansk uh, in the in the Kupiansk uh, direction as well. Uh, Kherson is the forefront of drone warfare. Okay, and basically how it works is the same principle as radios. Uh, if you wanted to jam a radio with an electronic warfare, it's simply strength over strength to overpower a signal. Uh, but because we have this river in between us, which can be perhaps two kilometers at some point, it's a big big gap. Okay, and a drone program relies on a an antenna system, which has to become efficient. Uh, it must build uh, in synchronicity, so to speak. Um, it's no good having the best drone in the world if you don't have the best antenna uh, to complement it. And then the ammunition that comes along with it. So simply by working on these frequencies, um, a lot of the best drone guns that we have are Ukrainian made now. Uh, for what you might buy a Lithuanian production for about 18,000 euros uh, will be sold to me at profit for about maybe $4,000, the equivalent of. And at one time, uh, there's high frequencies, low frequencies, there's digital frequencies, analog frequencies, which run an uh, NFPV, for example. Uh, those drone guns would only come to work on one range of frequencies. But now we have dual frequencies, uh, same as the drones, we call it crossfire. Um, they run on dual frequencies or they can switch frequencies because you, you will run in, you will literally see on your screen in an FPV, everything will go blank. Um, and what will happen, you, you'll run into an area of electronic disturbance. Uh, that's the Russians. If a good pilot can get out of that, um, you can carry on your mission. So as the drones develop, the anti-drone technology develops. Uh, when Crossfire came into the drones, and, and, and we do lead the way in innovation in the drones, but s quite often within within about a month or two, um, that advantage is negated. Um, but the, the fact that Ukraine can produce these things and patents be damned of other technology, um, Ukraine is a nation of nerds, uh, this is not a state project. Uh, this is decentralized innovations that are happening uh, from our IT workers to our engineers that are getting direct feedback uh, on the ground. And, and what works in Kherson, uh, if, it, if it won't work in Donbass, say, for example, because uh, uh, the direction of the enemy is, is quite closer in the engagements, we would not even try it in, in Kherson. OK, so um, it's. It, as, as the drone programs develop, as I said, from the antenna, I mean, you could you could sit in theory in another town and just have a relay of antennas and you could sit and drink your coffee. Somebody with a Hilux truck would go down to the beach and drop the drone. That, that's how we're getting our gains. Unfortunately, the last thing I'll say, uh, drone work has to be clever. One, one can't be overzealous. Um, if you manage to get very good kills on the other side, uh, Russia's electronic warfare, um, I've seen this particularly in Luhansk. Um, if you get too many kills, you, you essentially have to lay off an area for a while um, because they'll re commit more electronic warfare uh, to that area. So you have to very you have to pick regardless of the resources we have, even if we had infinite, 
uh, we have to pick and choose where we hit. It, it, it's, it's pure attrition of supplies, um, but, but rushes are increasing. And on the topic of supplies, I mean, I know you mentioned the, the situation with the small boats a, a moment ago, but what else is needed on the front line? And in particular, when we're talking about establishing bridgeheads and operating along the Dnipro. Well, uh, this comes not from me, but again, uh, from a lowly Scouser uh, drone operator, um, from a very effective team in Kupiansk and my former commander. Um, and so at battalion level, we need more artillery uh, because artillery cannot be negated by electronic warfare. And and thanks to our intelligence, we have such good intelligence. Uh, our drone teams, our Rosvitka teams, we call them. Um, there's many Russian positions that are complacent uh, for, due to the lack of our shells. We need mortar rounds, particularly we need NATO mortars, uh, the 120s. Uh, this is what they're asking for, the accurate ones. The Soviet ones are inaccurate. Um, our coordinates are locked in. There's many positions that, as I say, we have to be very, very picky of what we choose. Uh, we need more night vision capabilities. Um, currently, uh, we do have an increase, um, as I'm told, over the Russians on night vision drone capabilities. Currently, it sits that way in, in the better funded brigades, uh, night vision or thermal cameras. But those thermal cameras do well, they could cost $1,500 per camera. For a suicide drone, you, you do have to pick your target. Uh, currently, Russia is at the deficit in that area. A big, big thing we need, uh, and this is the wish list that they've, they told me to bring to you, uh, for anyone who's listening, uh, we desperately need plastic and high-quality explosives. Uh, we need plastic now uh, with impact detonators or time-release detonators. And the reason is the payload that can be carried on a drone. Uh, we have a very successful program right now in Kherson and Mikolaev, uh, mine recycling uh, from the TM62 anti-tank mines, but the TNT is not of high quality enough uh, to make an impact on the valuable targets. Uh, if we had plastic uh, across the whole line, and, and this problem is ubiquitous, uh, nobody has access to that for the drone teams. So of course we need, we're desperate for artillery, I would say above all, and our drone teams would be highly complemented uh, with better quality ammunition. We currently have a component crisis for our drones and, and that affects that affects NATO and Europe, the component crisis overall. That's not just a Ukrainian problem. Um, we're desperate for components. The prices in at least the past month have soared. Max, and one of the interesting things about this entire conflict is the way that sometimes relatively small places take on massive symbolic and strategic significance. Think of Bakhmut, think of Avdivka. And now Krinky, where would you place Krinky? How significant is it to the wider war? Well, Krinky is a really tiny village, so it's it's not nothing like this, a city like Avdi or a town like Avdivka. Um, I think it would it becomes significant if you take Krinky and you take Kozachi Lahari because then you can take this stretch of road and you can defend it with the Aleshki Sands and then you can build from there. And it may also be significant because it helps with crossing at Aleshki itself um, and the Antonovka Bridge, um, which which could be repaired with pontoons, for example. But it, you really need a, a significant upscale in activities. And one of the special forces opposite officers that I spoke to who was involved in helping land people at Krinky was really frustrated because he felt that the Ukrainian command didn't capitalize on the initial ground that they made and now they're stuck in Krinky and they're, they're fighting a kind of defensive action rather than offensive action. Now that could change as the weather gets warmer and it's easier to, to cross the Dnipro and it's less dangerous for soldiers who do fall into the river if their boats get hit. Um, more, there'll be more foliage, more, cut, more places for cover. Um, but it's and, and perhaps less water in some of the areas that to start to drain out. Um, but I think you know without the ammunition, it's such a it's such a basic but such a crucial and obvious thing that if Ukraine doesn't have the ammunition, if it's not able to maintain an artillery barrage across the Dnipro and cover soldiers who are advancing, it's simply not going to be able to drive the Russians very far. Um, and so that is that is is, is really key. Um, and what you know. The, the new thing that I was saying is that so Brandon there was talking about the Potemkin Island, which is a, a, the largest island of the Dnipro Delta. And there have been very interesting battles on these Dnipro Islands where special forces of one side or the other will go and they'll be involved in house to house fighting in dachas 
on those islands. But I think what, what I had seen, which is new and perhaps it's just the scale of it that's new and that's been reported significantly, is crossing actually onto the Russian crossing onto the Ukrainian side of the, the river itself, not on the islands, but actually on the river bank. And that seemed to be the scale that had been not been reported for a long time. Um, and that to, to me just made me a little bit nervous about the situation. Ukraine may be making advances in some areas, but if the Russians are confident to keep going across the, the river, then Ukraine hasn't necessarily dominated the Dnipro in the way that I had thought it was doing when I last visited in January. Brandon, just want to get some final thoughts from you. And I, and I wonder in particular, from your conversations with colleagues on the front line, what is morale like among the Ukrainians at the moment? Currently in Kherson, uh, as the day-to-day -day soldier goes, morale is very high. And the reason is because the casualty rates have sta stabilised. And I mean very little at battalion levels, perhaps one a day, perhaps none a day. Those lines are secured. Krenki is secure. As of now, Dachi is secure. Uh, that was paid for. But what is demoralizing, uh, particularly most recently from Odessa, many Marines come from Odessa. Um, that, that's a fact. Many came from Mariupol as well, and they're still in this fight. One of my best friends from 28th Brigade, which is also an Odessa Brigade, before we were decimated, it worked very much like the British Army, where people would join their local county regiments, you understand. Um, but one of my friends from Odessa in 28th, which is also an Odessa Brigade, um, his wife recently miscarried. Uh, they live very close to the attack. Um, oh, it would be over a week and a half ago now. Uh, there was no less than five children killed. Now, did she need that stress uh, when she was carrying child? No. Um, this is demoralizing. Um, he said to me, he says, what I fight for if I cannot save my family? Um, this is consistent through the war. And I've even seen this on a tactical level, um, on, on assaults, on failed assaults. Uh, when we would fight the other side of Karamik, outside of... Uh, outside of Avdivka, when the Russian assault failed at the end of the night, that's when the phosphorus came. That's when the cluster ammunition came. That that, that was out of spite uh, for what they could not take on a tactical level. They're doing that on a strategic level, and, and that is affecting our soldiers. But I'm telling you now, in Kherson, the casualties are very, very light because uh, we've paid for that ground, uh, and we do intend to collect. Brandon, we really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us again on Frontline. Thank you. And Maxim Tucker from The Times, thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Frontline for Times Radio. Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed already, you can do on our YouTube channel and listen to Times Radio and read The Times with your digital subscription for the latest on the war in Ukraine.